Welcome to the Rancher's Voice, presented by the Montana Stock Grower Association. I'm Jay Bodner, MSGA's Executive Vice President. And I'm Rayleigh Honeycutt, Director of Natural Resources. Join us for conversations surrounding policy, the legislature, and issues that matter most to ranching families in Montana. Welcome to this week's episode. This week we're going to talk a little bit about new Governor Gianforte's appointments to a couple of different boards and commissions, so we're pretty excited about that. We're also going to talk a little bit about this last week's legislation. Um, there was quite a bit that happened and, and uh, certainly some things that stock growers took a part of. And then we're also going to have our second part of the interview with the Executive Officer Mike Honeycutt, so we're pretty excited about that this week. Yeah, this is now our third episode, and we're hoping that listeners are enjoying and um, like enjoying the content that we're providing and finding um, it informational and something that you can take away. Uh, just a reminder for our listeners, make sure to subscribe to those weekly podcasts. Uh, also, make sure to follow us on social and make sure if you have any questions to send those questions to Kenny at K-E-N-I at mtbeef.org. And also make sure on each episode to like, share, and comment. So let's dive into some general things that have been happening over the last couple of weeks, Jay. Yeah, great. So we had an opportunity to sit down with the new director for DNRC, Amanda Castor, and um, had the opportunity to work with her over the past couple of years. She worked with Representative Zinke, and then she had a number of posts within the Department of Interior, and she's made her way here to Helena. So it was pretty pretty nice to sit down and visit with her. She certainly has just hit the ground running. Um, it was an opportunity really to kind of see what her priorities are. We shared a little bit of what the stock horse priorities are, and we talked a little bit about water. We talked some about grazing leases and state lands. Uh, we also discussed uh, the lawsuit that we do have over House Bill 286. We kind of certainly uh, informed her of that. That is a number one priority for us with the department. Um, and then we also just asked what her priorities are. And she really did just look at saying that she wants to uh, streamline. She wants to, if there's opportunities to uh, reduce regulation, to make things easier, quicker, faster, and still meet kind of the needs of the department, then she's certainly open to that. So uh, we had a good conversation with her. Yeah, uh, Governor Gianforte did do his executive order for the Red Tape Task Force, and uh, she did mention that as one of the agency's priorities. So I know that she'll be looking uh, in the next couple months over how they can find efficiencies and um, kind of cut the red tape where they can uh, for that agency. And so we're really excited to have uh, Director Castor on board, and we will be um, looking forward to possibly hosting her on a podcast in the future. So you all get to hear from her and get to know her a little better as we move into the next Next couple months. Yeah. One of the other appointments we've kind of been waiting for is the Board of Livestock. So that's certainly very important to us in the livestock industry. Um, we've had a, a strong board in the past and we've had an opportunity to get some new board members. Um, first one, Gene Curry, uh, past president of the Montana Stocker Association. He's been appointed. So I think everybody's familiar with Gene, but uh, ranches along the Rocky Mountain front um, and has been just a strong leader. And I know will do a great job on the Board of Livestock. So very informed of what the issues are on the board and um, did a lot of work previously with the board. So um, Gene, we'll, we'll look forward to him taking, uh, taking that position. Also, Alan Redfield down in Paradise Valley, a uh, past legislator, runs a ranch. Uh, once again, very familiar with a lot of the issues dealing with brucellosis and bison, and certainly also has proved to be a chair of ag in the legislature. So once again, very informed on the issues and do, will do a great job on the board. Yeah, very excited to have those uh, two guys on board. Uh, the livestock loss also uh, named three or had three new uh, members named, and so Doreen Gillespie, um, who is also an MSGA member, was reappointed to that board. Uh, she and her husband ranch up in Etheridge, just kind of south of the Canadian border, and uh, has been involved with the board before and will be joining again. Also, Elaine Alstead out of the um, Sweetgrass County area will be joining as along with Joseph Kipp. Um, so excited to have those three members uh, appointed to the board and be working with them in the future. Um, we've talked about legislation from the Livestock Board coming down the pipeline. So this new board will have a lot of great initiatives and things to be working on in the coming months. 
Yeah, certainly. And if one of the pieces of legislation with uh, adding a multiplier gets included into that, that will be, I think, first and foremost, that uh, they'll be writing rules for that if we can get that passed. So, yeah, look forward to working with that board also. Now, in addition to that, the Fish, Wildlife and Parks Commission, uh, certainly there's been a lot of interest in those new appointees. And so three of those uh, positions were appointed. Um, Pat Tabor, Patrick Tabor, he's out of the Whitefish area. He runs kind of an outfitting guest ranch up there. Um, certainly he's been on the Board of Outfitters, uh, very familiar from that issue. Uh, we've worked with him in the past on a, a number of issues, so um, he's a good addition to that board. Casey Walsh um, out of the Martinsdale area. Um, Casey is uh, the chairman of Fish Sims Fishing. Um, so haven't really had the opportunity to meet with Casey, but we look forward to, to working with, uh, with him also. And then Brian Siebel, he's out of the Billings uh, area. He runs and he's chairman, I guess, and president of Nance Resources, an oil and gas company. But he also does own a ranch kind of in Carbon County. And so he's familiar with how the impacts of the ranching community and wildlife. And so I think he's once again, he's pretty familiar with the issues. So the next step for these board appointments will be to go to Senate confirmation. So we'll be um, kind of keeping an eye out as those um, head towards confirmation and we'll be supporting um, where we can. Yeah. So next, we thought we would just kind of recap what ha has happened over the last week, and then we'll dive right into what is happening for this week. So let's hit let's start off with uh, last week's recap. Yeah, so let's start off with Senate Bill 65. That was the um, civil liabilities uh, law dealt with COVID. Um, and that is a bill that we did support. And really what it looked at is to ensure that small businesses were protected from COVID liability potential. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, it was, uh, I think, well written out of a, a sponsor. The governor has supported this. This bill has been moving pretty quickly. Um, it did pass the, the committee, passed the Senate floor yesterday. Uh, pretty strong support. And so it will be moving over to the House. And so once again, we'll be supporting that legislation as it moves through the entire process. Yeah, and this legislation is important because it was one of the uh, key um, identifiers that Governor Gianforte pointed out as he kind of rolled out next steps for reopening the economy um, with COVID. Yeah, and I think as it relates to agriculture, so anybody anybody that has an employee, you want to make sure that you have some level of protection there. And so this does impact ag as much as it does every other small business in Montana. Uh, just kind of moving on, the Department of Livestock, they did have their initial budget hearing. And um, that's an opportunity to get in front of that joint subcommittee. And, and uh, as they as the, the department lays out their budget, we get an opportunity to also stand in there and support that. Uh, we did have Jim Steinbeiser, our president, who was just in town for our board meeting. It worked out great that he could um, go over to the Capitol and provide some positive comments for the department. We did touch a lot on, you know, um, I guess our appreciation of the board and the executive officer for the job they've done with their budget. They've they certainly are, have a nice balanced, structurally balanced budget at the department. A few things they are looking for. We did have a, an increase in the designated surveillance area, so we need some additional general fund for that. Uh, we're looking for some capital equipment expenses at the diagnostic lab and then also some money for a new helicopter that we're also working on. We did really want to talk in, in front of that committee also because they do have a budget balance out there, mm -hmm. but we want to make sure that we protect that because we want that money to go toward a new diagnostic lab. So we did kind of generally talk about that to the committee also. Yeah, and then also last week, kind of moving into the House FWP committee, there were a couple bill bills that we testified on as well. The first one would be House Bill 119. Uh, that is in regards to elk licenses and assurances through the commission. Uh, this bill uh, we supported and testified on, it really was almost a cleanup bill from uh, a past language. So in 2019, some language was modified and it was realized that the omission of the commission making the decision for that was left out. And so this bill brought the language back in to say that the FWP commission would um, issue those tags. Um, this is really great and we testified on it for a couple different reasons. The first one is that it gives them the approval, which also will allow them to adjust numbers as needed if uh, population objectives shift and change. It also uh, 
allows for public comment and a little bit more transparency as those decisions are being made. And lastly, it continues to incentivize uh, private landowners who allow for that free hunting um, of citizens on their land. So a great bill we're supporting and uh, looking forward to continuing to support that as it moves on. The second bill is in regards to uh, trespass laws as it relates to hunting. And so we had testified and supported this bill as well. It is House Bill 108. Um, and really, it enforced some stricter penalties for those that are found to be trespassing on private property and just continued to um, support and um point out the importance of private property rights and how if people are trespassing, um, there should be penalties with that. Uh, that bill came from the PLPW and just want to continue to thank that group. Um, I should mention they were also the group that brought um, House Bill 119 as well. Um, and so that group was working hard in the interim to bring some uh, bills to the committees that are important to private property owners. Yeah, and that is really a constant complaint that we do get from our members and really just landowners in general during the hunting season is that, you know, trespass situations occur pretty regularly. And so it's important to make sure that that uh, levy that fee and that fine on those, to those folks that are willfully doing that enough to uh, discourage that, that mm -hmm. kind of behavior. So, um, and landowners know whether they're, uh, willfully doing it or mistakenly doing it and so you know those things um you know landowners can assess that kind of situation but it's it's a good bill um just kind of moving on we also did have senate bill 58 so this would include an additional hundred thousand into the livestock loss program and this was pretty specific that it would go into they have a couple of different accounts within the livestock loss so this account would be for kind of preventative measures and that, that is important for us as we try new techniques we try to implement either fencing or different techniques to try to reduce livestock losses for for uh, livestock owners and that's really our goal there so this would put additional money into that we think this is also a strong bill we know that anything with general fund is going to get a, a pretty serious look at but um, we have seen a trend of you know increasing depredations so this is once again we'd like to reduce those depredations on livestock um, just also kind of moving on uh, we also did have senate bill 27 uh, this would implement the multiplier and this would go in front of the livestock loss board uh, they would write the rules we would be involved in that but once again we know that there are general areas and i just had a conversation with usda wildlife services today and we were talking about specifically there are areas in the state where they've seen talking with landowners anywhere from you know six to one seven to one where that you have a confirmed loss to the numbers that you came in short so we know that this happens out there uh, in the state of montana and we want to make sure that um, you know livestock owners don't have to shoulder that entire burden yeah, so let's look at what is happening this week, uh, the week of January 18th. Uh, it was a lighter week kind of starting off. There was a federal holiday. So even though legislature was in um, in session, uh, a few fewer hearings than we probably would see in a typical week. Uh, but we did see one uh, in regards to natural resources and uh, water rights ownership. Yeah, Senate Bill 55, this, this um, bill, came out of the Water Policy Interim Committee, and um, there was a lot of work, a lot of stakeholders that were involved in this. It really was looking at making sure that DNRC's database on water rights uh, is correct and complete as possible. Um, sometimes when uh, property transfers from one area to another, um, sometimes those geo codes don't get uh, documented correctly, and sometimes the water rights, as they transfer from DNRC to the water court, are incorrect. And so this was a process to ensure that all of that gets done as correctly as possible. And we think that's really important for us as landowners, as water right holders, to make sure that any transfer of property, this gets done correctly. Um, it does require some responsibility by the buyer and seller to make sure you have your water rights correct um, as you submit those. But um, it was a good bill and, and a lot of work over the last 18 months and even longer than that to, to get to where we are today.
Yeah, in addition to us uh, testifying, uh, the Senior Water Rights Coalition testified as well, which we are a part of. And I think what Jay just pointed out is super important. Uh, the information is, that DNRC has is only as good as the information that they have. So there is um, some responsibility for that buyer and seller to get um, up to date and prompt information to them so that when decisions need to be made, that database is accurate. Yeah. All right, uh, moving on to later this week, um, on Tuesday, uh, the House FWP committee is going to be hearing a bill from Representative France uh, in regards to establishing a hunting and uh, angler community fund. Now, this uh, we are in a support of, and it really creates a do donation based uh, grant program for communities that are impacted by hunting and fishing uh, within their communities. So. It's a great bill. It will kind of show some appreciation to those communities and landowners and, and where they live on giving back a little bit. Um, details are a, are still to be hammered out a little bit, but we really feel like this is a great bill. We're really um, happy to support it, but there are opportunities to kind of simplify. Uh, current let, uh, The current bill kind of reads that you know, a new governor appointed boards could be happening and how the funds get distributed are a little, um, yet to be determined, I guess. And so we're looking forward to kind of working with the bill sponsor and folks to kind of continue that conversation on how to simplify it and get that money into communities. Yeah. And just kind of moving on, we do have um, House Bill 14. So this is the long range planning bill. And so this bill uh, includes all of those large capital investments for the state. And so within that bill, um, we have the new veterinary diagnostic lab. So that is a, a big priority for MSGA and really for a lot of the A groups. Uh, this bill is going to be heard over a couple of different days, um, pretty extensive. So we're going to be out there testifying. And so if there's some interest to just among kind of our listeners, um, this is a bill that you know, reach out to that committee and say that, you know, you do support the veterinary diagnostic lab. We know that the lab does a great job. Um, they have a great staff, they have good equipment, but it's just an aging facility mm -hmm. and it's time to, to look at some upgrades. And one of the nice things that uh, we can bring to the table once again, is that we have some money in the bank uh, to offer up to help fund that. And uh, that's a little different than some of the other um, programs and, and capital investments that are within House Bill 14. So, And I think your point about reaching out is so important because it is House Bill 14 and it is long range planning for building and bonding across all of state government. We don't want that veterinary diagnostic lab to kind of get lost in the mix. Um, and we really want to um, show up with a strong support for that for that funding. And just kind of moving on, we do have Senate Bill 98. This is by uh, Butch Gillespie um, out along the High Line. And uh, this bill looks at grizzly bears and grizzly bear take. So you have state statute that um, actually would allow grizzly bear take for livestock or for if, if uh, so you could uh, take grizzly bear if it was um, uh, basically killing livestock or threatening you as a person. Uh, this would be an expansion of that definition. So if it was threatening or killing livestock, you could take a grizzly bear. And once again, this is state statute. Um, so as these bears are still listed under the federal government under ESA and the Endangered Species Act, uh, that is the rules that kind of trump uh, management of grizzly bears. So make sure that, you know, producers, you don't get in trouble with this issue. Yeah. And then there are uh, a handful of other bills that have hearings this week that we're watching. So first one is Senate Bill 103. It's regarding revising embryo transfer technician licensing um, that is uh, in the Senate. Uh, we also have uh, Senate Bill 105 regarding penalties for trespassing as it relates to state land or FWP lands and connect collecting antlers and sheds and horns. Uh, House Bill 163 is a revised bill to increase the number of commission members for the FWP commission. We will be watching this one, but we do know that um, and are anticipating seeing a bill coming from the Senate side. 
that uh, helps define what those commission seats, if they were to be increased, would look like. So uh, kind of anticipating that and we'll be addressing that and tracking that bill coming down the pipe. Uh, and then House Bill 138, which revises some trapping and snaring tag requirements. And last, we have House Bill 86, which is the creation of regional fire protection authorities. Um, and Jay, we've seen this uh, bill before in a different uh version. Yeah, we did. We uh, have seen it previously in a special uh, session that the legislature had a couple of years ago and then also last session. Um, and there was some opposition to it and uh, that included MSGA. We were concerned about landowners being involved and really the costs involved with that. We do recognize certainly the importance of fire protection and developing these types of authorities, but we want to make sure there's a strong landowner voice. This did get heard over the interim policy policy committee. Uh, they did work up this bill and it is uh, does allow for a strong rancher voice in, in creation of one of these. So I think at this point, MSGA, we don't have enough policy to support, uh, but I don't see us taking any position, but uh, certainly in an improved version of this bill. So as you've heard, there are a lot of bills um, hitting committees this week and we'll be continuing to testify and track those as they come down the pipe. All right. Well, with that, uh, we are going to head over to our interview. As Jay mentioned, uh, our interview with Executive Officer Mike Honeycutt was kind of jam-packed when we did it and decided to break it into two episodes. So this is the second part of our interview with uh, Executive Officer Mike Honeycutt with the Department of Livestock. Mike, um, just a little bit more. I'd like to get it maybe a little bit more information on the DSA or the Designated Surveillance Area in Montana. And one of the ideas that has floated around in the past is that there, there are some requirements with brucellosis uh, vaccinations within that area of animals going in and out of that area. And, and there has been some uh, discussion, I think, among the industry uh, about looking at maybe just making a mandatory official calf hood vaccinates or OCV uh, mandatory statewide. And mm -hmm. um, I think from a department's perspective, you've looked at that in a little more detail. And, and uh, so maybe if you could just provide a little bit of how the department looks at kind of that concept or that idea and, and the approach that you've taken. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, thank you. That's a great question. I would say that our approach has been based in risk management. And when I say risk management, it's really about trying to demonstrate the efficacy of our efforts through our trading partners uh, outside of the state. Uh, you know, not as much what's happening within the state, but we certainly know that our big risk if we don't manage this brucellosis reservoir uh, that we have in the greater Yellowstone area, that we could see stricter import requirements from the states that we ship animals to. So we could see mandatory testing, for example, of all cattle coming out of Montana. Uh, and so our approach to looking at how we manage the surveillance area and the vaccination requirement area is about being able to demonstrate to those trading partners that we know where our risk is, we're properly surveilling that risk, uh, and, and we've got safeguards to make sure that we don't ship brucellosis positive animals out of that area of our state. And we see the benefit of that being the other 95% of the state that is not in the DSA, not having to deal with draconian import restrictions in South Dakota or Nebraska or Kansas or the places where they're shipping uh, uh, their calves to each year. Uh, so that's why we have typically not been an advocate, at least within the department. Uh, the conversations come up among our board of livestock many times, but I think our staff, including myself, has always been very consistent in advocating that statewide mandate, mandated uh, vaccination one is not necessary because our brucellosis risk is A, not statewide, and B, we worry about what signal that sends to our trading partners. We worry that our trading partners will look at that and say, well, if Montana feels the need to vaccinate border to border, do they really know where their risk is? Do they really, do they really have confidence in the surveillance program that they've developed? So as you can see through the rulemaking process, you know, we, our risk-based strategy has been to do full-on surveillance and testing in areas where we know we have wildlife infected with brucellosis that potentially can infect cattle. And so, you know, that's the designated surveillance area as, it, as the boundaries are drawn today. Those are areas where through elk collaring surveys and other efforts that we do, we know that risk of transmittal is there. 
the vaccination requirement and, and what we would like to see happen is that as the DSA moves, uh, you know, because elk are going to move. And I think if we're all realistic with ourselves, we know that that area expands without something different on the elk management side of the equation. That as that area moves and potentially goes into new counties, that those counties out beyond that and adjacent to that are the areas where we would require vaccination. And the, and the concept there is that, you know, vaccination is not foolproof against transmittal, but it lessens the likelihood of a, of a major train wreck. And so by having that vaccination barrier or boundary just outside of where the DSA is and those counties that border DSA counties, uh, we feel like what we're signaling to the trading partners is we know where the risk is, we're properly surveilling and testing it. We've taken an additional safeguard of a ring of vaccination around that. But the rest of Montana, you have no need to worry about. You know, you have no need to require vaccination on cattle coming from those areas to your state. And you have no need to require testing of those cattle coming to your state because we feel very confident that the, that, that, that is brucellosis class free status cattle uh, that you're receiving from those areas of Montana. Thanks. Following up on that, Mike, and the DSA, uh, share with us a little bit about the status of the quarantine facility as well as what that is looking like maybe moving into the future administration changes and things like that, and then um, what that might look like moving into the next couple years. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, that that's an area where I think there's some some openness on how we're going to do. There, there's no there's no proposed changes to how we're operating now. I guess I would point out for for your listeners uh, the the piece of law that really provides us the ability to manage bison as as a need of of concern because of the brucellosis infection that they have uh, is 812120, uh, and a lot of people are familiar with that code because that's that's the particular piece of law that those advocates who don't want to see the Department of Livestock involved in the management of Yellowstone uh, buffalo, uh, that's, that's the piece of law that they, they come here to Helena and try to, to uh, attack. It, it's funny you mentioned the change of administration because a key piece to that law that a lot of people forget is in the very first paragraph of that law where it says, under a plan approved by the governor. So what that means is, is that the Department of Livestock and the Board of Livestock's role and responsibilities derives from what's approved by the governor. And so we know there are some existing executive orders that, it, that are still out there from past administrations. I've had no contact with the current administration as to whether they continue those executive orders or change those executive orders. Uh, so that, that's a piece that's maybe a little bit fluid and we'll, we'll see how the, the new uh, administration here in Helena uh, wants to deal with that particular issue, whether they, they want to maintain the status quo or if they want to go back to, to some of the concepts of how we managed it before, or if they have brand new ideas on how to manage it. As far as the status of the quarantine facility, uh, the quarantine, right now there are bison in quarantine at two facilities uh, around the boundary of Yellowstone National Park. Uh, the Stevens Creek Capture Facility, which is actually inside of uh, Yellowstone National Park, uh, sort of across the river from Gardner. And there's some quarantine bison in a facility at Corwin Springs, just a little north of there, but still inside of that Gardner Basin area, uh, which was formerly a facility the USDA was, was using to do some uh, uh, transmission brucellosis research. Uh, they were, you know, primarily uh, working on things like contraceptives and those things about trying to stop abortions and, and stop spread of brucellosis within bison and, and other species. Um, so right now, there's probably about 150 uh, bison that are there for quarantine, a mixture of males and females. Uh, Yellowstone did announce for this year's winter operations that there was no more room to bring new bison into quarantine. So there'll be no new bison added uh, and put on the tr uh, track of becoming brucellosis free this year. Uh, but the bison that are there, uh, we operate under the, the USDA uh, research protocols that were developed several years ago. Uh, so it's, it, it gets very complicated to talk about quarantine because they're all sort of on different timelines. If you capture juvenile females, for example, it can be up to two and a half years before you can certify them brucellosis free because you really can't be confident in those bison until they've gone through a calving cycle and continue to test negative for six months after that first calving. Bulls, uh, 
you know, particularly adult bulls is the shortest sort of time frame uh, because their risk of transmission is, is much lower. Uh, but with juvenile bulls, it's a little bit longer because uh, you want them to go through uh, through puberty and you want to see, uh, make sure that they don't start, um, you know, showing signs of, of brucellosis that can sometimes happen. Uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, uh, as you hear me say that, there may be 150 in quarantine, but that doesn't mean eventually 150 get shipped. Because once you have an animal that tests positive, that animal has to be removed from that population and, and euthanized. Um, so, you know, the status of quarantine right now is that there are some bison that are that are in the process potentially to get classified brucellosis free and move. And then and then they further go for quality assurance. When bison go to Fort Peck, a lot of people don't understand that those groups of bison when come in have to be segregated from each other, allowed to, to leave that facility. So there, there's quality assurance is done even for another year before they can uh, be mixed in with anyone's general bison population. Um, so there is a there's a few as I said in the pipeline uh, but we don't anticipate that this winter there'll be any new animals just because of the lack of space and facilities uh, that there'll be new new animals added to that program during this upcoming winter. Thanks. Um, so, Mike, you mentioned a little bit about USDA, and so one of the other um, kind of national efforts of BIN has been from USDA is to look at some of these RFID tags, the radio frequency tags, and um, maybe trying to um, look at implementing that uh, to track animals more efficiently. And um, so they've thrown out a proposal. I know that the, the department has provided some comments along with our organization, and and uh, so I just kind of like to kind of hear what you think from a department's perspective, um, how that process may work and how that may, uh, I guess, Im Im impact uh, Montana producers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the RFID tags always been, and, and mandatory RFID tags is always an interesting conversation around this office. I mean, I think most people would, would understand and respect that our our veterinarians uh, uh, love the concept. It makes it, it makes their job tracking animals and and for certificates of veterinary inspection and those types of things much easier from a regulatory side if you're doing animal health regulation. Uh, but we have a producer board, and so when that conversation goes to our producer board, there's always a lot more skepticism about it. Uh, you know, we did make comments on the the recent uh, proposed changes. Uh, for, you know, animals moving out of state, uh, unless they're going direct slaughter, you know, requiring RFID tags, you know, in 2023. And kind of what we've put forward, you know, through the board, and, the, and those comments were the comments of the Board of, board of Livestock uh, and vetted through that, through that group, is that, you know, before we get too strong in, in mandating the use of this type of technology, there's just a lot of unanswered questions, um, you know, what is the technology going to be that we're going to use? Or is it, it, it ultra high, high frequency tags? How are you going to account for the different readers and the different things that people need? Uh, I think a big question that comes up uh, here is, is who pays the bill? Who, who is the end recipient of the benefit of that? And are they sharing in the cost of that? Or is all that cost flowing down to the front end producer who's, who's maybe in initially putting in the tag. And as we all know, uh, when, you're, when you're counting your margins, if you're blessed enough to have margins, sometimes in dollars, uh, you adding three, four, five dollars of expense can and very quickly take away what little bit of margin you had. So that's, that's a concern of who's paying the bill. And so we, uh, we continue to support that. As long as USDA wants to mandate that, there should be uh, some funding available uh, for producers to help offset that cost, or some way of making sure other people in the supply chain who are benefiting from that are, are also sharing in that cost, and it's not just our producers on the front end. Another concern here in the department is obviously around brands. Brands is very uh, important to this department. It's very important under Montana state law. It is the prima facie ownership brought in sorting that out uh, or even sorting out when animals get mixed up whose animal belongs to who and helping producers navigate that 
But brands has also been an important tool in animal health. When we've had traces in, so if you look at what they're doing now at USDA, um, if that tag gets put in an animal right before it gets shipped out of state, um, and that there happens to be a disease trace and investigation that takes place, when it gets back to that point where it was tagged, it'll be our brand's records that will tell us who has this producer crossed up with, where else has this animal been, where has this animal shared time with others, so we know who we need to now go out and quarantine and test. So brands is still a very, very important role. So, so we lift up, and I think most Western states and the Western Canadian provinces have always uh, sort of taken a stance of, you can do what you want to do with RFID tags, but there is still a place and still a need for our branding identification system uh, to have, have some value and, and be a part of this solution as well. Uh, because brands may not be great for tracking an individual animal, but brands and the, and the types of movement records that we collect here at the state level are very, are very, very good at tracking groups and, and where they've been and, and producer relationships. Uh, and so that, that becomes a very, very important component of animal disease traceability. And I think there's some concern that, you know, once you move to RFID tags, uh, that, you know, will people then begin to believe that that brand system is obsolete and maybe take away resources from it, take away value from it. And, and we see a lot of unintended consequences uh, to uh, those types of things happening uh, because of, of how much we use brands. And, and Montana is not alone in that. All the Western states that are, that are brand states, uh, I think, place a very high value on that system. So that was reflected in our comments as well that, uh, you know, regardless of what USDA does with RFID tags, here in the West, there's always going to be a need and a place for, for brands. Uh, and we want to see that. Uh, continue to be supported by USDA. And you mentioned brands, Mike, so I think that's a great bridge to our next question, which is that the brands re-record is currently happening. And uh, I know all of the letters initially went out to registered brands, but what can you tell us about the status and um, any information that's beneficial to our listeners regarding that re-record? Uh, yes, yeah, so re-record has started the online. If you go to our website, if you want to online re-record, that is open. It's been open since uh, January 1st. Obviously, people can mail back in uh, uh, the paperwork they received. Uh, the big thing I could say at this point is uh, we have we have mailed out everything, uh, and we have received some back with forwarding addresses, and we're trying to turn those around, get them repackaged and shipped back out. Uh, but we do know that we've had some returned uh, without any forwarding address. Uh, we're going to make every attempt we can to locate those people, even maybe even using our local inspectors and using that local intelligence to say, do you know who this person is in this county or this area, uh, to try to make sure everybody uh, has an opportunity to get that packet and re-record the brand. Uh, you know, we've received some questions about, you know, why would you go to those types of links? Because... Uh, you know, it is a brand owner's responsibility to know that this is what they're supposed to do. And I normally answer that question by saying it's, it's very rare when the state, a government agency, has a right to take a piece of personal property that has value away from someone uh, if they don't re-record it or re-register it. So we feel like the bar for contacting producers is really high if, if the end result is potentially losing something that may have been in your family for, for generations. We wanna make sure we've done everything we can to reach everyone. So with that said, if you're a brand owner who's, who's listening to this podcast and you have not received your paperwork in the mail, you do need to be contacting the Department of Livestock so that we can uh, find out where it is and at least get that packet to you. Uh, we do have all the way through December 31st to re-record, but we would like to see as many people get that off their task list early as they can especially this time of year, uh, calving is around the corner. Um, you know, lots of things that people are going to have to do for our, for our producers out there who, uh, outside of ranching, also farm. They're going to get into planting. They're, you know, we're just, the year is not going to get any better in terms of, of having time to, to deal with an administrative task like turning this around and getting it set back into the department. So we hope people uh, jump on it early so they don't forget it and we're not having to make a lot of effort later in the year to, to reach a lot of people. Uh, so far, 
you know, uh, estimates, and this is clearly an estimate, but we think we've already had about 10,000 returned, which is good. I mean, for a weekend, that, that's, that probably equates to about 30% of the brand owners uh, that are out there that, that we contact. So having that done in the first week and seeing that flow of mail come back in uh, is, is, is really critical. Um, you know, some things that I would, I would mention, some things we've gotten questions about early on uh, from, from producers. Uh, one thing we do know at this point in time, if they go, if they haven't looked at that letter yet, is that uh, the brand owner name, it pulled in the primary contact. So, you know, we've had lots of questions of saying, uh, well, you know, this brand is in uh, Mike Tunica and Jay Bodner, but it says brand owner only says Jay Bodner. Well, that's because Jay Bodner is the primary contact. So, so if people see that, I would say that if you feel like you need to verify that the brand ownership is correct, uh, please call us. But, but, if you, uh, but if you see that, that one of the issues there is it was pulling the primary contact out of our database, not necessarily the full long legal name. Uh, that that brand might be uh, registered to or the LLC or, or things of that nature that the brand was registered to. Uh, we've had people ask about, you know, why locations of the brand uh, was not on uh, the paperwork that went out. Uh, your brand locations are on your certificate. Uh, you know, there was some technical issues there with it would have just made the packet the way that you mail merge these things. Technically, it would have made it much more complicated trying to pick up particularly for certificates where you have multiple species, uh, trying to pick all that up and have it sort out. If you're concerned uh, that about the positions of the brand and whether that's right, that's something you can call our office and have our staff verify for you. Uh, but what but I can tell you, be rest assured that the positions you have on your brand certificate is what's in our database. We just didn't pull that out and put that in the notification uh, because of uh, some complications that would have caused on the technical side. Great. Great, Mike. Well, um, I think I'm within the 30% because I did send mine back, so I didn't want it to get lost on my desk. And, and uh, as an organization, we're going to continue to kind of remind uh, the producers out there to make sure that they get those brand re-records -re sent in and, and taken care of because we know that there's no grace period. And so we want to make sure that producers do have that opportunity to, to make sure that they get that done. So just kind of moving mm, on, we, we, we have had a few questions from uh, the audience and, and, and it uh, surprisingly or not surprisingly uh, comes down to bison. So um, mm -hmm. I might just kind of uh, start with a couple of those. Uh, there is some questions about bison. So if bison leave the reservation and they enter uh, private land on non tribal land, um, what are the landowner options in that case? Yes, so uh, one of the interesting things about our various definitions of bison that exist in state law is, is that there is tribal sovereignty. So those tribal bison that are under tribal jurisdiction, you know, don't really fall into our state definitions. However, we would still uh, consider that, that uh, to be feral bison. And I would encourage people if they're having issues with that, uh, to contact their local district investigator with our department and make them aware of that. Uh, and uh, that district investigator would try to help them in determining ownership. If it is tribal bison, that district investigator can make contact with the appropriate tribal authorities to try and make arrangements for that animal uh, to, to get back where it's supposed to be and on the property it's supposed to be on. So that is a Department of Livestock issue. That's what our, our district investigators are out there for. No different than if you've got your neighbor's cattle uh, across the fence on you, just like you would call them for those particular issues. Uh, for those bison issues, I would encourage you to call our, our district investigator. Um, and, you know, game wardens, uh, because tribal bison is a little bit different. It's not clearly in the Department of Livestock Court. It's not clearly in the FWP Court. But I would hope that your, your game wardens uh, would be helpful there if you've got a relationship with a local game warden to try and help you sort that out. But the one thing I can say with certainty is, is that our staff, our district investigators, if you call them, uh, they should help you with that issue. Great. Thanks. And you did mention, I think a part of that question dealt with classification, but you mentioned those those bison, you would look at that as feral bison. And I know that in state statute, we do have a definition for that. So 
Um, mm -hmm. That's how really the department would be looking at that. Exactly. Yes. So another. Yeah, and I don't know. Oh, go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to say, you know, it's always good to sort of uh, sort that out that there are wild bison, which are those bison uh, that are not owned by a person, uh, so they're held in the public trust. Uh, or have not been reduced to captivity. So that applies to, to things like Yellowstone bison, uh, obviously, because they're held in the public trust, their they're property, the government. Um, domestic bison, <coughs> excuse me, domestic bison are those bison that are owned by a person or a corporation. Um, and so once something's been owned uh, by a person or a corporation, that, that has to be a domestic bison that should be paying per capita to the Department of Livestock. And feral bison is those domestic bison that are not on the property under the control where they're supposed to be. And I always like to point out that bison have no access to open range in Montana. So bison are a fenced-in animal. So if someone next to you owns domestic bison and those bison are not on their property, they have no right to that like you would with cattle, particularly for open range, if you're outside of herd districts and things of that nature. Anytime bison are not on the property uh, under the control of the person who should have control of them, that's a feral bison and the Department of Livestock uh, should be called and we should be returning that bison uh, to put home. Great. Great, thanks, Mike. Uh, another question that we have is in regards, and you kind of hit on it early on when we were talking about potential legislation regarding meat processing, but from a meat inspection standpoint, um, there is potential for new legislation to be coming down the pipeline. And uh, we just wanted to hear from you, what are those potential impacts regarding meat inspection and uh, Department of Livestock staff and staff resources? if um, more capacity does open up? Uh, that's a very good question. Obviously, you know, so the first thing I would start with is that, you know, federal uh, law is what governs meat inspection in the United States. We do have some state laws, but to be able to get federal funding, to be able to operate an inspection program, it is required by law that there, there's 27 states like us that do that. We're required by law to meet or exceed federal law. So as, as you talk through that, a concern I have is that, you know, I do hear ideas and concepts from time to time that people want to bring forward that they think would be helpful that potentially would put us in a place where the state law is now weaker than the federal law. A potential consequence of that is that we, because there's federal primacy on this issue, that we lose our ability to operate a state program. We lose the funding, we lose any legal mandate to be able to do it. And so all of those processors that, whether they're retail, you know, getting slaughter inspection with a USDA mark of inspection from us or custom exempts or meat depots, all of those licensed entities would then have to derive their license from, license from the USDA. They would have to deal with federal inspectors, not state inspectors. Uh, and uh, so we're allowed to do that as long as we meet or exceed federal standards. Um, and so the staffing impact there is, is that we would not have meat inspectors in Montana if the federal government ever made that sort of determination about Montana's program. So I do worry about pieces of legislation that may go too far and stray into that area that that potentially brings that into play. I do believe and I do support that there are a lot of things we can do. Now, most of them have to be done on the federal side, you know, lifting the, the uh, moratorium on state inspected USDA and state inspected facilities with the USDA market inspection being able to sell their product across state lines. I, I think there's some common sense things that could be done there that would open up more marketing opportunities, make uh, entice our current processors to grow capacity, maybe provide incentive for new people to enter in and get into the industry. Uh, there's certainly a lot we've got to do on the labor front to make sure there's labor to work in these facilities if we're going to grow them, because that usually becomes a big limiting factor on the ability to grow these businesses and grow the capacity. Um, but, you know, those things that we do on that side, if there's things we can do that keep us within that uh, uh, meets or exceeds standard, but help grow processing capacity, uh, particularly retail processing capacity, where you have to have an inspector there every time you slaughter animals, 
that probably does mean more boots on the ground. So that means uh, more appropriation from the legislature towards that program. That means Department of Livestock adding FTEs, adding inspectors to be able to handle that. Uh, we, we have a little bit of uh, flexibility uh, and I guess what I'd call uh, unused capacity in our program now over the last two bienniums. We actually pressed because we knew if we saw an expansion in meat that we wouldn't be ready for it. And the legislature thankfully uh, worked with us on that uh, to give us a little bit of extra capacity. We, we brought on two relief inspectors during the last biennium who aren't assigned to plants. They can go anywhere we need them to go. So we've got that built in, but if we overrun that, then we would, we would eventually be adding even more people, which means uh, we would have to have the expense uh, uh, not just of, of paying their salaries, but there's obviously training and certification they have to go through. Uh, there's a vehicle. We got to have a vehicle for them to be able to get to where they need to get to, have the you know personal protective equipment, safety gear that they need to be able to do the job. Uh, so there's operational expense uh, that gets added there as well. So there is a budgetary appropriations uh, factor to that if we grow uh, meat processing in that our program sort of has to grow along with that over time. So I think that's a wrap for this week. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Um, uh, once again, we um, we very closely monitor all these bills as they come up for the week, and then we look toward the next week also. We're also up at the Capitol and, and visiting with legislators and, and gaining kind of their ideas on what may be coming down the road. And so it's a good opportunity for us. So once again, we'll share all those uh, that information as we learn it on our end. Definitely. And I think it's important to note that this session is more um, engaging from people from the outside than ever before. So if you have an interest in any of the bills that we're mentioning, always feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're more than happy to uh, be a resource for our listeners. But in addition, there are opportunities to testify via Zoom if driving into Helena is not something that you're interested in doing. So just a reminder, if you are interested in doing that, to make sure you need to register for that the noon before the day of the hearing. So if the hearing is on Tuesday, you have have until noon on Monday to do that. You'll get a link sent to your email. And then once the hearing starts, you just click on that link and they will call you in to testify as it's your turn. Yeah. So with that, we'd like to thank everyone again for joining us on our podcast. Make sure to subscribe to our weekly podcast. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And always make sure to like, comment, and uh, share each episode. If you have any questions, feel free to send those to Kenny at K-E-N-I at mtbeef.org. And we'll thank, we thank you and look forward to talking to you next week.